um, to uh, our, I don't know how many presentations we've had thus far in our, in our Recovery and Resiliency Advisory Committee, but today the topic is childcare. I know last year, last week I said it was going to be um, arts and culture and tourism, but I think we switched dates. And so that's next week with Brian Ross, uh, Tom Katzemeyer. I don't know if Tom's doing it, but I know we're going to have some um, others present. And I know um, Joe Navarone, I believe, from the airport is going to be with us next week. So we're going to have Dr. Bertley from COSI and Joe Nardoni from the airport. Got it. So we will, um, we look forward to that presentation. But today we are going to talk about child care. And I know that <clears throat> many of our panel, um, of our panel, many of our committee members have expressed um, the desire to want to hear, wanted to, to hear about child care um, from the very start. And we, um, you know, held back and kind of waited until the mayor's director of education, Matt Smito, who's with us today, went through some of his um, work at the guidance of uh, Mayor Ginther and started on some short-term goals. I think they were looking uh, to end the year with, um, you know, some things happening in maybe in Congress with the one of the CARES uh, bills and, and so forth. And then um, <clears throat> we also, uh, heard again, you know, just about child care and the importance of child care and, and workforce development, um, which is one of our topics that are other topics that we are uh, looking at. And that was our very first topic, I believe. And so with that, uh, we wanted to be responsive, not only to our committee members to um, bring child care to the forefront, but we also wanted to hear more about the work uh, that Matt Smito has been doing and that Eric Carolak in particular have been doing um, to advocate for um, all things child care, but in particular some policy changes and, and so forth, long term and short term. And we want to hear about uh, the impacts of COVID-19 uh, on child care, child care providers, uh, the business of child care, as well as what, what it's going to take to um, be have a resilient recovery. And so uh, today we have uh, Eric joining us, Matt Smido joining us, and Misty Norman, who is the owner and director of Heavenly Kids Center for Learning, all joining us today. We look forward to the presentation um, to our panelists. Uh, you have about uh, 25 members of uh, the Recovery and uh, Resiliency Committee. We typically don't all introduce ourselves. We come from various parts of the sector. Um, uh, the sector, various parts of, of business and nonprofit and community uh, representing various sectors here. And there are, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at least two individuals uh, here that um, work in the area of child care and provide child care services. And in addition to organizations like YWCA, we provide um, child care for homeless children as well as um, school aged child care in school districts. So with that, we turn it over to the panelists for your presentation. And after the three of you finish your presentation, we will move into the Q&A portion of uh, the conversation. And I will do my best to direct questions your way. Uh, Hannah will assist, as will um, Mike Stevens and others on the, on the, uh, on the viewing on the virtual uh, platform. And we will um, go until... Uh, we end at five o'clock. So thank you very much for being here. And who's up first? Hannah. Eric is gonna kick us off and Eric, you should have screen sharing capabilities. All right, great. Thank you, Christy. Um, and everyone, I hope uh, you can see the screen. Is that looking good for you? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna begin and actually we're gonna sort of rush through a bunch of slides if I've, so do you still see the slides? Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Um, and um, we'll we'll go rather rapidly. We'll slow down in the middle and um, and we'll leave time for um, conversation for discussion um, toward the end. Okay. Uh, Misty is going to provide a real in-depth, more real life on the ground perspective. What I'm doing with this uh, presentation is a broad overview, broad brush strokes with some data points included. Um, as you know, I'm Eric Kroak with Action for Children, which is Central Ohio's Child Care Resource and Referral Agency. Um, for about 50 years now, we've been serving not only Columbus and Franklin County, but the surrounding counties. We reach about 
9,000 adults and 50,000 children, more than 50,000 children uh, throughout our, our work in various programs. Our work is all about empowering the adults who have the biggest impact in young children's lives, their uh, parents, um, uh, caregivers, uh, teachers, making sure they have the skills, the strategies, the behaviors really necessary to have the biggest impact and make the best uh, experience possible for young children. And we do that through a variety of programs. Now, this isn't really about action for children, so I'm not going to dwell on all of the work that we do. Uh, I will emphasize, though, that part of what we do as a resource and referral agency is collect data, is keep tabs on the information that's out there. And this is actually the only region of the state where there is an integrated data platform that includes not only administrative data that comes primarily from, from the state government, but also caseload data that comes from staff who work directly with child care programs more than 1,200 across the region, and a survey data that we've been compiling in particular since the beginning of the pandemic. And much of what you're going to hear today from this presentation is based on uh, that data, especially the Central Ohio Child Care Provider Survey, which has reached statistical significance, a little unusual in a survey, and, um, and has some very stark um, pieces of information about where we are in, uh, with child care in our community. Um, Misty's going to do that deep dive. We'll look ahead to some potential ways of solving this, even though I know that's not the focus of today's meeting, but at least get our, uh, create a level set for all of us and get us thinking about ways that things might be made better. Um, I want to begin by talking about what child care is. Um, this will sound pretty basic, but I know that not everybody has had a connection or a recent connection to child care. And the first thing to emphasize about it is that it's both work support and early education. At Action for Children, we like to say parents earning, children learning. And with 85% of brain development occurring before children step foot or crawl or are carried over into a child into a school building, it really is the key to intergenerational poverty fighting. This is the first, the real, the fundamental two-generation approach to solving uh, poverty. Um, it's also an equity issue. I know that many of you don't need this to be emphasized, uh, but I want to draw out a couple of points about it. It's an equity issue in terms of the children being served. In America, children have been majority minority since 2012. Since 2012, the children in our child care centers have been majority minority, three-year-olds beginning at three years. And that's significant, not only for the future, but also for what happens in those programs today and who's in those programs. It's also an equity issue for women, women who work. Um, you've probably seen the headlines. Since the pandemic began, the United States has lost three quarter of a million women working specifically because of the challenges around childcare. In fact, in the last quarterly Department of Labor statistics that were released just recently, the net loss to our economy and employment could be completely explained by the loss of women in the in the workplace. That's of specific significance for childcare because women and single heads of households, some of whom are men, rely heavily on childcare. And with our workforce being disproportionately female and disproportionately African American and people of color, especially in our community, it's an equity issue in terms of who is doing this work. In fact, the workforce is at the heart of all things childcare and early learning. It is first the workforce behind the workforce. This is not a business like other businesses. Now, no slight to other businesses that are having a challenge, but without childcare, other people don't go to work. And so it's crucial that this workforce in our community uh, is well supported. It's a workforce issue for other aspects of our community, other industries, other service sectors, and it's a workforce issue in terms of the crisis our workforce in childcare is facing. It's aging, it's uh, poorly credentialed, it's undervalued in terms of the importance of its work. Uh, the low wages of childcare workers mean that a significant portion of them qualify for public assistance in our community. It means that uh, one out of seven, it's about 15%, um, are actually at 100% or below the federal poverty level. That's double the rate in other occupations. So this is a workforce that is having trouble making ends meet in a host of different ways uh, that is calculated. And it, it's added insult to injury in this pandemic. The lack of benefits as part of the compensation package is particularly stark. Uh, about 15% of childcare uh, staff have access to health insurance in the midst of a global pandemic. 
So the consequences for not valuing this workforce are significant in terms of itself and in terms of the broader workforce that it supports. Childcare is absolutely a workforce issue. And childcare is a non-system. You know, when we talk about housing, about um, uh, affordable housing and homelessness, we know where those providers are and they do critical work. I'm not trying to say better, higher, worse, something, but we know where they are. In the case of childcare, it's sort of all over the place. It's childcare centers that you know on the street corner that you pass on your way to work when you go to work. Um, mm -hmm. It's in-home family childcare providers, some of whom are licensed, but some of whom are not. It's both, both public institutions, public preschools, and private community-based organizations. Some of them are for-profit, some are not-for-profit, the YW, the YM. Some are church-related, some are not. Um, and, and even what it is varies. Some of it is full day, full year. That's what I tend to think of when I picture childcare. But, you know, childcare is also part day, part year. And so the solutions we have to create to accommodate the non-system systemness can be kind of a challenge. Um, childcare is a public-private partnership of sorts with a variety of funding. And frankly, it's not working particularly well for most people. Um, it is both highly regulated for a provider to offer, and it's also easy to enter. Family child care homes to become licensed have to meet certain requirements, but not everybody has to become licensed. So the competitors of the child care experts on your committee are, are actually people who can open up their front doors to take in care for neighbors' children at a fee and thus compete. It's expensive for families to afford. In Franklin County, um, the cost of child care for um, an infant is greater than the cost of tuition at Ohio State, and it's under-resourced. It hits families at the time when they are least capable in their lifespan to be able to, uh, to afford a significant expense that like that, and the workforce itself under-resourced. The lack of public assistance, even though we have millions flowing into child care, is really stark. Nationwide, about one in six eligible families, our funding allows for about one in six eligible families to access uh, tuition supports through publicly funded child care, or something we sometimes call Title 20. So child care is, it's complicated. And for you, as you think about how we look beyond the pandemic, it's important to understand it's also what we tend to call in the field a trilemma a careful balancing act between care that is available in the place you need it and at the time you need it. Odd hour care is very important, weekend, off shift, especially for retail and other establishments, that the care you can find is care you can afford and that whatever you can find and afford is also care that is of decent quality so that the promise of early childhood, edu childhood education is, is being paid off. Balancing that is something that, well, Gina, Melissa, the Y, the I am, all, Misty do every day, pulling together that mix of affordable, accessible child care, quality child care for their families. But for families, it's an often, it's an impossible thing to get all right together at once. Um, there are just too many challenges in many cases. So that actually is the picture before the pandemic. When you add the pandemic to it, you just have further disruption. And we all know about the closure order. In child care, that meant that most child care programs closed, but since the pandemic began, about one in third child care programs have been operating continuously. They've been there for our essential workers and the rest of us the whole time. And we owe them such an enormous debt. Uh, I, 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 words fail me. They are our everyday heroes, as we say at Action for Children. When childcare reopened for everyone who could afford it, which occurred at the beginning of June, it came with a sort of new situation. The pandemic rules that were created when childcare was closed largely continued, and that meant changes to practice that affected the number of children you could serve in one setting, that affected the number of staff you had to have for those children, the cost of cleaning materials, and a host of other things that will make some sense. All right, if you've uh, tried to eat out since the pandemic, you'll know the kinds of added costs you see in a restaurant, and you just have that in, in even more so in, in the case of childcare. The long and the short of it is, with the pandemic has come a new math, and that new math is such that 
there are too few children currently enrolled at prevailing tuition, what people are able to charge for childcare, to yield enough revenue to cover the increased costs that childcare providers are experiencing. Now, Misty's going to tell you what that means in her program, what that means to her staff, and, and how they are living every day. But broadly speaking, I can tell you a few other things about the, the, the difficult conditions we are in currently. Our most recent child care provider survey that I mentioned uh, painted a very stark picture of what those pandemic conditions meant. Nearly one in four child care providers told us that they didn't think they could make it through the end of this month. And I also have good news for you. It's not quite turned out to be that bad, but that tells you something about their state of mind. Nearly one in four anticipated having to close before the end of this month. Two thirds of them are losing money and significantly almost half are paying $1,000 plus for additional costs related to the pandemic. Um, some of that can be around staffing, not just PPE. And most importantly, I think the sort of a light bulb for some people, uh, if you haven't been in a child care program, this will probably seem so odd, is that enrollment has been depressed first by those regulations, but now and continuing by the reluctance of families to put children in out of home care. About half of our seats back at the time the survey was done uh, were, were empty. And that means that it's an added challenge for providers to be able to stay in business. One third are experiencing staffing shortages. We think that may have eased up a little, the same with the en enrollment um, and with significant openings. Now, we've been able to take a first guesstimate at what the actual loss to childcare in our community has looked like. And that's what you'll see here. This is an actual map. Um, I, I'm not the designer of the slides. Uh, my, my folks did a fantastic job, I think. But, um, but you don't see the whole map. But those are actual providers who have closed since uh, February. Um, the net closure rate for our community in Franklin County is 5%. So not the 23% that was feared, although we do have a couple of weeks here. And uh, and probably a sign that since that survey occurred, there have been some positive things that have occurred. Um, some steps the city has taken, uh, some some steps in Congress. Um, Washington did finally pass a a, a a relief bill. I'm happy to talk about that in some detail. Um, and of course, the um, release of a vaccine, vaccines, and and of course a new uh, leadership at the federal level. So some positive signs. This is not as bad as it could be, but in a normal year, we would not have a closure rate. We would not have a net closure rate. Um, and so this is quite a stark comparison to the past. Now, that survey that we provided um, was done at the request of the city. And it was done to sort of jumpstart a process of putting together some recommendations about what could be done to make things better. And I told uh, Matt and our partners at the time that this begins and ends with money. This is a math problem. Doesn't mean that you can't do other things to help. It just means you you can't tell her, you know, that family child care provider. You can't tell her the center director. Um, things are going to be better with, with with something that doesn't materially change their opportunities. Um, and but still, when we convened providers in our focus groups, when we uh, read their open response to the survey, there were a number of insights. I, this isn't the forum to go through all of that in detail. You'll have future meetings in phase two uh, around that. But there are some things that I just touch upon in, uh, in broad highlight. Um, there's a lot of concern with child care providers that they are not given, afforded, accorded the respect, the appreciation that they warrant for the jo their jobs as brain builders and economic engines in our community. And, and so I think as you deliberate, consider the where she is in terms of her expectations, in terms of her sense of value and worth. Um, you know, just this week, we, we got the, well, I guess it was last week, we got the news about the vaccine and the distribution by prior, prioritized by our state. Our state has chosen to prioritize K-12 teachers, bless them for all they do, but to specifically exclude childcare teachers. Now we're only one, only three other states do that. Um, and it says, it's a statement of value, right? It says that if you teach a four-year-old 
that's less important than if you teach a fourth grader. And, and so the 30,000 active, maybe it's a little bit more teachers in early childhood settings are being told just right now around the vaccine, you're different, it's different for you. Um, another kind of awareness recommendation that came out of this process was to help share the notion that it is safe to return. Now that's a decision every family, every parent has to make, but there is some good information, a Yale study, the most recent study that was done uh, in Ohio through Case Western Reserve that shows that community spread affects COVID in childcare, but that childcare doesn't enhance, increase, expect the spread of COVID out beyond its setting. And that's, uh, that's something to consider also, that there is a, a mental communication with parents around childcare in the pandemic that uh, may be necessary to address things. Um, another set of recommendations were all around the workforce. And, and that gets back to that we don't value brain building the way we value so much else. In Franklin County, uh, childcare is one of the bottom five uh, occupations. And that's not unusual, it's true most every place. Um, but the lack of wages and benefits means we've got serious problems, serious problems with turnover that affect the ability to deliver quality. Uh, we've got serious problems with supporting a workforce that is under a lot of stress and strain, especially right now with the pandemic. So figuring out how we support that workforce, provide wraparound supports. Gina, I know is doing some great things with uh, food and other resources that go with their uh, teachers. That's just really important. A third set of recommendations are sort of broader. They're around access to resources and to system change. One of the other differences between K-12 and early childhood childcare is that in K-12, you're not paid every day based on attendance. In childcare, you are paid literally in some cases by the hour. And so the ability to make sure that there is um, a steady revenue and system and infrastructure building revenue is a real challenge in childcare. You know, this process resulted in a small group pouring over these recommendations, uh, looking through them, ranking them, coming up with some thinking around how they display in terms of time, cost, and impact. This is our initial plotting of that. Matt, forgive me, I haven't gone back and, and done the updating of this. So we've already gotten a little bit further down the road in terms of trying to think through what can be done. There are some things underway. I, I want to encourage you to think that we have lots of possibilities here. There's a lot of opportunity to make things better. And, um, and your organization, your committee is in a perfect position to build back better with an eye to equity, an eye to long-term uh, poverty fighting, long-term improvement of our community. And, and doing that will require some thinking about how to address childcare in the months and years ahead. Hey, I'm, I'm happy. I've been talking a lot. I feel um, like maybe too much. I'm happy to pause now and turn it to Misty, who can describe what all of that broad overview means in a specific location with specific people, real children and families. Misty, I'm going to stop screen sharing, turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Eric. A lot of information. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, first of all, thank you, Christy, for the opportunity to come and speak to uh, the committee. I'm excited to, to know that uh, Melissa and Gina are on the committee. They are the best of the best in the field. They're my colleagues. They're my mentors. So hello. And I'm excited that even as we have these uh, conversations today, that I know that they're going to continue to reinforce uh, what, what has been said. And uh, Eric has, has shared a lot. And... Um, as I thought about what I wanted to focus on, because one of the things that he state, stated is that childcare is complicated. Um, I, I was going to say it's a mess, but I want to stay positive and, you know, um, a little bit more professional. But a better word is it is extremely complicated. Um, and so I was trying to think of, you know, what do I want to say to the group? Because there's so many different uh, compartments and departments and you know, pieces to the puzzle and some of the puzzles are, puzzle pieces are missing. And as I uh, sat down uh, to watch the inauguration uh, today, I uh, had this crazy thought and I said, gosh, what if I had the opportunity to ask President Biden or talk to President Biden about childcare, what would I say? And I was like, wow, that's, that's a pretty heavy uh, uh, 
pretty heavy thoughts. So in case I never get that opportunity, I figured I would pose that question or that uh, conversation to you in five to seven minutes, because Hannah said I had five to seven minutes to have this conversation. But I would, I would uh, as I thought about that, there would be a question and a suggestion that I would pose to him. And the question would be, how as a community uh, or a country did we miss the importance of early learning or early or, or child care? Uh, because like I said, you know, on, on things that uh, Eric was sharing, the complicatedness of it, how do we miss, how do we miss just the importance of early learning? And so there's so much information and data out uh, in everywhere, honestly, on how the first five years are so critical uh, for, uh, for, uh, for a child. Um, that literally the first five years, if we can solidify the first five years of, of a child's life, then the likelihood of them being successful is so much greater. And as I thought about that, I kind of compare early learning as uh, to a house. Um, if you think about a house, uh, the most important um, part of that house is the foundation. And if you think, you know, child care is, is that. The first five years is the foundation for that child. And if we don't secure it, we don't seal it, we don't uh, stabilize it, uh, it, it's not going to be stable. Um, and so we really have to put an emphasis on how critical those first five years are and, and bring that to the light. And again, I stated that there's a lot of data um, out there that is, is concrete evidence that that it, it's it's true, <laughs> and and even the information that um, Eric shared uh, validates that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about early education is it's an investment, and as we are seeing our country go through all different types of changes, we're looking for investments um, that's going to bring us stability as as a person, as a family. And child care is that investment that we know is going to yield a positive return. And so, you know, we look at, uh, I, and I'm not a stockbroker. I don't, I don't get into the stocks like that. But we do know that people are investing in Apple and, and shucks, all different types of things. And going back to my question, how are we missing investing in children? So I just kind of want to pause on that. Um, out of all the things that we're investing in, we're missing that critical piece of investing in children because they are our future. And I know that that's a cliche, but you think about stabilizing the workforce. We are raising up that workforce. And if it's not stable 20 years from now, we're raising that generation that will be 20 years from now, your employees, the next uh, president or city official. So it's critical for us to just really get a grasp on what child care means for our community, our country, our world, honestly. And we take it for granted that these little lives are just that. And then we start looking at them when they're five years old, but we've, we've, lost the first five years where we were supposed to solidify uh, uh, their, their, their brain. Um, and I don't want to get all technical, but their, um, their brain. And so that is my question. My suggestion would be we have to stabilize the workforce. That is critical. Um, we must support the workforce behind the workforce. And Eric talked heavily about um, what the workforce looks like. And I'm pretty passionate about that. Of course, children are my heart, but if we don't have qualified, and I'm going to stress qualified, uh, well-paid staff that is able to um, build these young lives, then we're just babysitting. And so what I, what I feel that is very important now is that we understand the challenges that our workforce goes through. Um, again, Eric talked about the pay. So 
We are a star rated center and I, I don't know if everyone is familiar with that step up to quality, but some of the requirements that our teachers have to uh, deal with is, first of all, they have to have a comprehensive lesson plan, which has to meet all the content standards. And so early learning has content standards. We have to meet you know, social, emotional, language, arts, math, science, you know, nine domains. Um, we have to do observations. We have to take observations. We also have to basically have a gray card for uh, the, the child. We have to have parent teacher conferences. And these teachers are making $10 an hour, $12 an hour. And they're being asked to have the same basically job description as a kindergarten teacher who may be making three to four times more, but yet the, our early educators are having the same um, basically job description. That's, that's not okay. Um, and so they're coming with these criterias that they have to uh, fulfill in order to educate th this young child, um, but yet they're not getting paid for it, nor are they equipped so a lot of times we're hiring staff that have a CDA, which is, it takes about a year to, to get um, 150 clock hours in childcare, or they might have a, a, an associate's degree, which is two years. Um, but the training that uh, takes place within a CDA or early uh, or an associate's degree, in my opinion, and I hope I don't have any Columbus State or Ohio State folks, uh, Sometimes there's some gaps in um, preparing that teacher for the reality of what they have to face. And I've been in childcare for 14 years. And 14 years ago, I, I might have had one child that we considered a behavioral issue where they, you know, they're having tantrums. Now it's unbelievably increased. I we're seeing at least three to four children in a classroom that are having major challenges. And now what's on the, what has been a hot topic is trauma informed care, but teachers aren't getting that in school. They're not being educated on how to deal with a child who spits in your face or cusses you out or is throwing chairs. And we see this uh, every day and I can, uh, probably guarantee that Gina and Melissa, Melissa has experienced this as well. And so the stress level that our teachers are facing is, is unbelievable. Um, the stress, the lack of pay, the lack of experience to deal with the, the reality of educating a child is, is like I said, we have to fix that system. And I feel right now, that we have to look at education from birth through 12 instead of K through 12. Education does not start in kindergarten. It starts at birth. And until we start to um, look at our educational system in that regard, we're going to have these issues that we're, we're facing. So we have to look at that. And I want to reference some things that um, it was in Eric's PowerPoint. There were three um, takeaways at the, the, the end, he stated that uh, we needed to build awareness. And to me, my background, believe it or not, is in business management and marketing. But I had, I have four children, four grown children. The way I got into childcare, my oldest son had some, uh, some learning disability, which turned into behavioral issues. And so that's how I got into to the field. But uh, business management is, and marketing is my field. And just building awareness to me is that we have to educate the community on what early education is. We're not babysitters. We're not daycare providers. We're early educators. We're doing the same thing as the school systems are doing. And so there has to be a comprehensive marketing plan that um, shows who we are, explains or tells our story, and it has to be a, co a collective 
Um, the second thing that Eric mentioned is uh, the the su supporting the, the workforce, which I kind of shared uh, earlier. Um, again, just providing a comprehensive plan um, to stabilize our workforce so that they can stabilize the children. And it's almost like a ripple effect or a circular, honestly, as our teachers are, are, are stabilized, the children are stabilized. Parents who are on your jobs, uh, think about a parent who knows their children are taken care of, how effective and efficient they are on their job, as opposed to a parent who is constantly thinking about their child who is not in such a st stable you know, facility. And so again, it's circular. It 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 makes everything works work. And there's a, actually there's a quote that I really like uh, that states, um, "Teachers make all other professions possible," and that's so very true. Not only are teachers educating uh, your employees on how to do what they do if the, if they have to go to college, but our teachers also provide opportunities for parents to go to work as well. Um, the third thing I, I wanted to, to touch on in uh, Eric's PowerPoint is the resources and infrastructure. So the system, the systems change. And again, going back to looking at early education um, with the K through 12 system, we can't be eliminated. We can't feel less than, especially when we are solidifying that child's next phase when they enter kindergarten. Um, there's a, I've seen it, I've had the honor of having many parents come back and say, hey, this is my child's great card. This year I had a parent send me a, a picture of her child who graduated from high school, who was once a, a preschooler or infant toddler here and said, thank you. And that of course I cried, <laughs> like, wow, 12, 13 years ago. And she remembered that and reached back out and said, hey, because of what you did, my child was successful. And I feel that that is the story of early educators. And we have to be validated that we are, have such, make such an impact in children's lives and set them up for success. Um, and so again, just, I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling on. I apologize, I know my time is up. Um, but again, I just wanna just share, hopefully the conversations can be housed around those three uh, points, building awareness, supporting the uh, workforce, and also just the system change uh, in uh, early childhood education. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Misty. Um, you are a passionate advocate and um, business leader in this space. So thank you very much for sharing your story. And um, we're going to go to Matt Smido, um, Director of Education for the city. But I do want to say that Dr. Butler, we do have Ohio State and Columbus State representatives here. No, but they, uh, Dr. Butler in particular, and she can say this in her own words when we get to that time, but but she's on, she's, She's one of my board members, so I also, you know, echo her sentiments um, that we need the honesty um, about the programs, and she'd be happy to, you know, continue to have the, the conversation. So don't don't be shy. I mean, th and this is the space where we want to have honest conversation because we're also talking about recovering in a resilient way. And so if we don't have that honesty as we consider our work, um, then we won't be able to do the things that we need to do. So, um, you know, thank you thank for you. for for your transparency. Um, I'm going to move now to Matt Smido. Matt, it's up. It's over. It's up to you. No, <laughs> it's all up to you, Matt. Uh, but your your turn at bat. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks to everyone at the committee. Um, trying to share my screen now. I'll be very, very brief. I promise. Um, so I'm going to say what what Eric didn't say, uh, and what Misty almost said is things are bad. Things really are bad. We have places closing. Um, we have teachers making, on average, what, Eric, $10.67 an hour in Franklin County. Uh, most of them do not have health insurance. Uh, most of them do not have sick days. Uh, they are working in these centers, uh, potentially putting uh, their health at risk. Um, we have children who are at home, and they need to be in their, these centers for the health and development of themselves and their families. Um, again, I, I just want to mention something else uh, that, that Misty said. Um, 
and and this is I think is where the good news came in comes in is uh, the mayor has not missed the importance of early learning. Uh, neither has have the a lot of the members in our community. Um, I think probably everyone here has heard the mayor say that one of his priorities is to make sure that every kid in our county and our city is ready for kindergarten. Um, he sees this. We're working with a lot of partners now. Um, one great thing about my work uh, is that I work heavily with our partners, Act for Children and Future Ready, who are our early learning leaders in this community. We really do work to support whatever they're working on. Um, so the mayor's work, we've been focused on years on, on expanding pre-K in the city, and we've, we've done so very successfully. Uh, recently, uh, we have a shift gears to working, to, again, on one of Missy's points, on, on birth to five in education. Uh, the mayor has charged our public-private partnership, Future Ready, with developing a birth to five strategy for the county. Uh, they have done so. They are working uh, on it now and ready to release it soon. So I'm sure everyone here will be engaged in that work uh, when it's released. Um, but the mayor did come knowing the, the status and, and, and the shape of, of this industry in our city. And one of his concerns was, you know, when uh, our workforce goes back full time, are we going to have spots for our workers to send their children so that they can go back to the workplace? So he asked us to take a look at this. Uh, Eric, uh, uh, thankfully, did a, he has such great relationships in the community with our providers. He was able to get such great rich data that was you know, um, not good data, but it's still data uh, that showed the shape that our providers are in right now. Uh, losing money monthly, some in danger of closing, spending a lot of extra money on cleaning supplies, um, uh, extra teachers because of the ratios and the size of the classrooms. Uh, so back in July or August, um, Eric, we put together a grant program. Uh, we worked with Action for Children and Future Ready Columbus and our partners at the county. Uh, and we advocated uh, for a grant program for all providers in Franklin County. Um, we provided about um, uh, almost $8 million in CARES funds between us and the county. Um, and these were for grants to help stabilize our, our uh, child care providers. Uh, we provided up to $24,000 for a community <clears throat> provider and up to $7,500 for a home-based provider. We provided these funds to 452 providers in the county um, and uh, providers that serve subsidy eligible children. So uh, we think this went a long way to help stabilize these child care providers. But looking at Eric's data, it's a drop in the bucket. We have to do more. Um, we actually have a new proposal sitting before the mayor right now waiting uh, for his uh, approval. Again, working with Action for Children and uh, Franklin County and some of the other partners that we have. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's all, uh, Christy, that I really wanted to say. Um, I just really wanted to reinforce everything that, that Eric and Misty have said um, and really looking towards this group to help us um, you know, figure out some solutions. It's, it's gonna take our entire community uh, to, to get here and just to, um, to serve these families and these children, these providers and, and ourselves too. Um, we all need these providers to, to perform these, these critical roles that they have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. And we want to ask that you stay, um, you know, stay, stay with us uh, during the panel portion of the conversation, which we're going to move uh, into now. And um, and looking at the chat, um, I see Candace um, here has a question. Uh, Candace, would you like to ask your question? Um, it, is it, or I'll ask it for you. However, you want to handle that. Yeah. So my question is, you know, one of the things that we've seen from other. Um, panelists was examples of other people that are have figured it out that are that have, are doing it better. You know, everything that you guys are talking about resonates and, and I'd be surprised if most of the panelists here haven't heard some of this in some fashion. But, you know, I, I love your recommendations, but is there a proverbial roadmap somewhere that of someone who's figured it out? Eric, you want to take a stab? You want me to take a stab at it? Um, um, I'll, I'll be happy to try. Go ahead. Um, but um, I'll take so, so Candace, this is a great question. And if we were looking at an intervention in a classroom, a specific intervention about how you might teach a, 
uh, math in a fourth grade classroom or, or, or in a preschool setting, we might be able to point to well-researched examples. But in terms of creating what is essentially or replacing or fixing what is essentially a, a market-based system, um, there really isn't. Every community in the country, every state in the country, this is experiencing some kind of child care crisis right now made worse than by the pandemic. And that's why Congress has been acting slow. It's only, you know, I don't want to totally take a whack at them, but it could have done a lot better. And why the city and county had to prioritize resources to also support peer back in the summer. Mm -hmm. And even with those, th those were stopgap. Um, in terms of sort of the building back better, we really have to be rethinking how we deliver early childhood education. Um, I, I know from talking to uh, those of you on uh, in this committee that are, are in the early childhood world, we often talk about there has to be a better model for doing this. One that isn't driven by the largest uh, single payer, which is the federal government through the state and the counties, uh, at, which ultimately sort of dampens prices in the market because it's the state reimbursement rate that is the largest single purchaser that doesn't leave it up to individual families, again, at their weakest point in their life cycle, which only exacerbates the primarily socioeconomic status, but other issues, uh, the, the unequal distribution of wealth in our community, um, so that only certain families have access to whatever they can get, and, um, and, and addresses this market-based aspect. Now, someone also asked in the chat about schools. The challenge with schools is that they are no better set up to take in what is essentially an increase of one twelfth of their population. That's what you know, we, we underestimate how much is being done by the child care sector. And so they aren't the silver bullet either. Um, what we do have examples of out in other communities are very strong efforts to address the workforce. They're expensive. They're not cheap. Um, in Minnesota and in California, very strong workforce initiatives, whether it's in the form of uh, wage supplements that help stabilize the incomes of those individuals and, and also reward educational attainment or in the form of other kinds of supports. Um, so they are fixes for part of this, but for the overall situation, the, the overall, if we were sitting here talking about restaurants, I'm sure they have a number of issues. There's no, it, it would be different though, because there isn't the same reliance on restaurants for other people to go to work. Um, in the case of childcare, you have a largely market-driven activity that is that does that has very few examples of good, solid, functioning markets. Uh, One-off examples of high-quality, excellent programs. We've got those in our community, but they also struggle financially in a marketplace where anyone can undercut them in terms of offering care that's quicker, easier, um, whatever the case may be. I wish I had the silver bullet to give you. If if I did, somebody in New Jersey, somebody in Texas would have, and we'd all be copying that same silver bullet. It just, it's just not there. It doesn't mean we can't keep thinking at it, but it's just not the silver bullet I think we all would love. Madam Chair, if I if I could add something, I would just say to, to Candace the question, you know, what communities are doing this right. Yeah, you know, I really think that we are. I think we have our strategy in place. You know, we we've worked to expand pre-K. Uh, we have a, a mayor who recognized the importance of of, of pre-kindergarten and, and kindergarten readiness. Uh, we have a, a public private partners working on a birth to five plan to Misty's point about focusing on kids before they get to kindergarten. Um, you know, uh, I think we'd be further along uh, if we didn't have this pandemic right now. Um, you you will see things such as teacher pay and health insurance in the birth to five plan. Uh, there is a whole section on the quality of early learning programs that is in there. Um, but we do have to to work with our our partners, all of our partners, to make this happen. One of the biggest problems is there's just not enough cash in the system. You know, we have yeah. teachers who make low wages. You know. There's, there are a lot of, of municipalities, local governments across the country that, that fund early learning programs, but that's because the state, their states, and that's because their federal government don't. What other local government supports K-12 work? None, because we don't have to, because that's funded by the state and federal government. So, you know, there's this, you have to make sure that, that our community and our state understand the importance of early learning. 
Great. And then I had one uh, follow on question. Um, Misty, you made the comment that early education is not daycare and, and I can appreciate and understand the difference. My question is, do we need both? Do we need the early education piece and then still that traditional just making sure that the children are safe and healthy piece? Or do we need to change our mentality to just focus on early education? Great question. You're right, we do need both, but we have to blend them because our early educators still have to make sure that child's nose is wiped, the diapers are changed, that they're being cared for and loved on, but we have these children nine and 10 hours a day and we have to do more than just wipe their noses and you know, clean their faces off. We have to provide a, a, an educational basis so that we keep them developing and meeting those content standards that I had mentioned. And so saying we're a daycare, it eliminates the educational portion. But saying that we're early educators does not eliminate that we're still providing, you know, the basic care uh, that that children need. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to touch on real quick with what Matt was saying too. Um, and I think you had asked about, is there a successful model? I feel like there's pieces to a, a, a successful model but it, it, it's like a puzzle, they're, they're all over the place and we have not come together as a community to put all of those pieces together and create a system that will work for our, our state, our city or our state. And yes, we have some amazing things happening, but we have to bring those pieces together and create a, a systematic puzzle. Also bringing uh, the universities to try to recover myself. I'm so sorry about the universities, but thank you for, you know, bringing that to my attention, Christy, because they're, they're a, a vital part of preparing teachers is bringing them in the, the loop too and uh, ensuring that we are continually, continuously updating um, best practices for the field. Yep, agreed, Misty. Um, I want to give um, so um, Ms. Barnes, you're you're up next, but Dr. Butler was just ahead of you, and I do uh, want to give her an opportunity to uh, respond if she wants to share anything. Uh, Dr. Butler, Rebecca, is she gone? She may have dropped off uh, for another meeting. Um, so, uh, Mrs. Barnes, you are up next with your question. Well, I think that everyone answered it for me. Uh, the reason I brought up the school system was because the teachers have to be certified to teach in them, which means they have to complete a, a, a set curriculum. And so I thought that maybe that might have uh, changed the, the, the statistical difference between those who are in childcare without that certification versus those that are. Um, so then my question becomes now is, is there a set curriculum for preschool teachers at this time? I, I can answer that. Um, there's not a set curriculum. Uh, providers uh, can select their own curriculum, but there is a set content standards um, through the Ohio Department of Education is birth through five content standards. And there's domains um, within those content standards that we have to ensure that we are touching on. And so uh, whether you're selecting creative curriculum or a Montessori base or a Regio, uh, we have we have to ensure that those domains are being uh, touched on uh, in that particular curriculum. Eric, did you have anything? Thank you, Missy. Eric, did you have anything you wanted to add there? I thought I saw you take yourself well, off. I was over trying to type in chat. I'm very slow with that. So um, I'll just say what I was trying to put in there, which is that it's important to remember, you know, the CEA salary schedule, uh, the standard, you know, for standard, it begins at 44,000 and, and change, which is double, exactly, almost exactly double the average childcare teacher salary. So um, the schools also, um, they begin at a different bar in terms of resourcing. Again, a lot of challenges there and my heart goes out to, to that system and the people in it, but when looking between them, it's a really essential thing to understand. 
our workforce is also a bit more diverse and I would want to be careful about the trade-offs one makes in terms of thinking K-12 like um, applied to our, our current workforce. Um, just something to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eric. Um, <clears throat> other questions, I don't see any other questions loaded in, in the chat, but other questions from our committee. Hey, Christy, I have a question. Sure. So, um, you guys were awesome, first of all, in terms of making the case for this. What I, I'm just astounded that this always sort of falls by the wayside. Um, when I hear that um, daycare providers can't get in the queue for the vaccine, just things like that, like, is there something structurally happening here? We have we just not valued this work enough over the years and we're now catching up with it and suddenly realizing that we need to pay these people more, they need to be trained. You know, it just goes on and on and on. What do you guys think? Is there something structurally that I'm missing here or some political impediment to it? I mean, clearly we are all in support of work and we all understand how important it is that children get the best care at those young ages before they go to kindergarten so i just would throw that out to our panel uh, madam chair if i if i may mr katzmeyer thank you yes absolutely um in ohio there is a perception that early learning is child care it's babysitting it's not important um you mentioned the vaccines pre-k teachers cannot, they're not part of the B1 rollout. That also means teachers in dis, pre-K teachers in district schools. I just learned this yesterday. So in Columbus City Schools, if you have a pre-K teacher in a Columbus City Schools building, in a, in a Columbus City Schools pre-K program, and they're teaching in an elementary school, the, the teachers who teach in the kindergarten through the third grade classrooms can get the vaccines, but the pre-K teacher in that same building cannot. Yes, there, there, there is some de de definite um, problems in this state. Yeah, that is definite. Um, I, I will add my two cents, and I'm going to just say one word, and I'm going to say sexism. Um, yes, I'm sorry. It has been difficult for years to get traction at the state level in particular for, and, and this goes back to, for me personally, when I was, you know, a paid advocate in this work, to get people to recognize, one, that it's not just babysitting, two, to value early, early learning across the board. You know, as you might imagine, we had legislators, you know, depended, depending on where they were, you know, um, you know, just how they value it. We also have a Senate president right now who does not value, did not value Step Up to Quality, has wanted to dismantle it, does not value early learning, um, you know, and um, it has been difficult to get traction, to get people to pay attention, um, you know, and, and largely the business owners, because these are small and, and medium-sized business owners, are dismissed, um, you know, and largely they are women business owners. And, and, you know, again, from an equity perspective, when we talk about a number of the children and, and bringing equity into learning, um, disproportionately black and brown children, you know, not receiving the quality, uh, you know, quality uh, programming, quality care, and, and poor children, children in, you know, poor parts of the state. So it has been difficult. Um, I actually have a conversation coming up with somebody in the governor's office. This is one of my issues. One of my drums to beat, I, I am a part of uh, the groundwork group that Shannon Jones leads, which is a statewide advocacy effort, uh, birth to three, Misty's uh, been involved in that as well. Um, but, but it is t difficult, Tom, to get traction for all of those reasons that I just laid out. And in, in contrast, and when the pandemic first broke out, I said to our team, you know, I was like, we need, to get, be getting as much traction and attention from the governor's office as John Barker can get for the Restaurant Association. And we're not. And and it is, it is you know, it is for these reasons. And I, I, don't, I don't have anything else but, but these reasons for years 
these same reasons you really have been the reasons why we can't get to traction. So Christy, Madam Chair, this is Stephanie Hightower. You, you know, I, I waved my hand a couple of times and I was going to be quiet tonight. I, I, I was going to be quiet, but you know, Tom, you ask a great question. And so the reality is, and Christy started, um, not only is this sexism, this is about structural racism at its best. And when you talk about all of the stats that Eric talked about earlier today, we're talking about black and brown children. We're talking about black females. We're talking about lower raised jobs, which from primarily are being held by black people. And so until we begin to have more conscious and more uncomfortable conversations about racism, Tom, then we will continue to have this kind of inequities and disparities as it relates to not only childhood, um, early childhood education, but also K through 12. Um, uh, and, and we can go, go on and on. And so, you know, I appreciate what the mayor has done with this committee because it is about resiliency. But part of what this committee also has to start looking at is a lot of what we're talking about is racism. It is what it is. And so we've got to have the conversations. Um, when you look at the black and brown people that are in poverty and all those stats that, that, Eric, that Eric talked about, it points to it's racism at its best and the system doesn't allow it. And when we start talking about curriculums to Christie's point, you know, um, step up to quality and having five stars gives you that credibility and gives you the ability to talk about you have the right curriculum in place. You have to have certain standards in place to get the five stars. Um, all of my centers are my 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 head start centers are five stars. And then you can build on that curriculum to do other things. But until you can get teachers compensated, and I, 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 I partner with, with the Y, with our Head Starts, and we fight every year. The biggest, our biggest fight is about teacher salaries so that we can maintain the continuity of te teachers who love what they're doing, but we don't want people to go into debt and we don't want people to not be able to take care of their own families because they are making those minimum wage jobs. So again, and a lot of this is about racism. When you look at who the workforce is and who in fact are teaching the kids, um, folks don't wanna pay black folks. Um, and so when we have that conversation, a lot of, the, a lot of the, the answers to the questions that you're raising, you will have a better appreciation for those. Yep, thank you, Stephanie. Um, uh, Eric, did you want to respond? And then Keith Stevens has a question after this. Eric? Um, uh, uh, you, you both hit the nail on the head. And the only thing I would add is we, we treat this issue the way you would expect the nation we saw on January 6th would treat an issue where the workforce is 95% female and double the rate, 28% uh, African-American. And there's an ideological component to it as well, that motherhood has a certain degree of sanctity uh, and that when the state interferes with early years as opposed to K-12, it's, in, it's encouraging a weakening of the nation, the nanny state. But all of that is intertwined with, you can't pull it apart, racism and sexism and call it misogyny, you know? Um, so you're, you're both right. I, there's nothing I can add to that. That's the only way we get around that is greater conscious wearing, the consciousness raising, and the kind of work that this committee is doing. Yeah, and we do what we can at the local level. Um, you know, I mean, some of it is it's going to be regulated by the state because they are the ultimate kind of regulators of this industry. But you know, doing what we can do at the local level, like Dayton and Cincinnati, have, have you know come up with their own funding. Uh, processes they've taken it you know try to get some wrestle some of it away from you know I say wrestle it from the state but created their own destiny with their own funding sources their own plans etc which you know I believe that's what the you know, mayor Gens was trying to do with uh, the future ready plan but you know we also just have to make sure that we build a plan that allows you know all providers to be successful that builds in equity that deals with the structural racism and those, and those kinds of things. But, you know, that's, that's probably our best hope because if we hang our, you know, hopes and dreams, so to speak, for uh, improvements at the state level, 
I've just I've seen it, you know, going on for a very long time where it's very difficult to get to get traction. And you've got legislators there that even when the governor's administration moves the ball forward, you've got legislators who pull it back. And I'm sorry, someone else was trying to speak and I spoke Christy, over. It's Gina. I, before we move on to a different question, I, I kind of wanted to just reiterate the point that you were getting at and that that these kind of racist, classist structures that are bound in the government right now is what is essentially what is fueling how we are paid. And so that that since the money is tied up in structural racism and it is not being um, allowed to flow in the way that affects the child in the best way, that is why most of us continue to struggle, even if we are very high quality centers. Um, and I think it's also very important when um, Stephanie brought up the structural racism, policies that are in place today in the state of Ohio disproportionately affect African American children who are served in inner city high quality um, centers like the ones that Stephanie have, I have, Melissa has, Christy has. And rules only apply to us because we serve those kids when they do not apply to other centers who are in New Albany who do not serve those kids. That's and right. that is something that is really significant that needs to be brought out when we talk about equity and equity in a system that is really built on racism and sexism. Yes. Thank you, Gina. Well said. Well said. Keith Stevens, you're up next with your question. Hey, thanks, Christy. So uh, I agree with everything that uh, Stephanie shared, and, and it is a challenge for sure. I am trained to look at business models and apply oftentimes technology to impact and improve and, and hopefully make those business models more sustainable. The question I have is, are there remote, and what we've learned through the pandemic, there's remote remote learning going on. I don't know how well it's being delivered or received, but are there remote certified learning platforms that can be leveraged to augment the lack of teachers uh, and, 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 and get some economies of scale that's affordable? I, I would, that question would be for the presenters. Are they leveraging any platforms now to augment their curriculum? And if not, do they exist? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I don't know how consistent or how thorough or widespread they are. I just know of some, um, a couple uh, instances. I know CDC Head Start, uh, when they were, uh, when their classrooms were closed, um, and they actually utilize a lot of uh, empty Columbus City Schools classrooms. So when the school buildings themselves were closed, they did switch to remote. Um, and uh, Missy and Gina and Melissa would obviously be good to talk about how difficult it would be to work remotely with a two, three, four year old child, one year old child. Um, in addition, we did work with uh, the Crane Center at Ohio State, which is a very, very uh, valuable partner of ours there as part of the, the Education and Human Ecology College at Ohio State. And they do a summer uh, boot camp right before kindergarten for us. And uh, they did it this year completely remote uh, with about 100 children. And they, they focus on disadvantaged children in low income neighborhoods. Um, and they just gave us their report. And it, it was very successful. Uh, but I don't think that there is anything uh, consistent or or really comprehensive out there that I know of. Eric, I don't know if you know of anything or if Misty, Gina, Melissa, if you are aware of anything or have used these uh, curriculums or platforms for, for, for this age of children anyway. Yeah, Matt, this is Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie, we're, we're, we're using those, to, uh, Matt. That is the only Great. way we, we've been able to, to maintain um, especially since we're a federally funded program, we yes. had to be able to show that we were actually doing classroom um, participants. But it is very hard, uh, Keith, because you have to have a parent there to actually keep that young child engaged at 
that computer. So it's it's very difficult and it's very challenging. Gina, were you going to weigh in? Because I have a little bit to add to this. Well, I was um, going to say that there, like Stephanie said, there are platforms, but I think the most important thing to know and understand is that the the introduction of technology in the, these years of brain development is not necessarily something that we want to uh, promote because kid it's there it, there's a hundred times the evidence that show that they shouldn't be in front of a screen um especially in that birth to two space at all zero zilch um because of brain development and how it works and when you're looking at this young of children that birth to five space much of their development really does need to happen in hands-on um one to one interfacing with their peers or with their teachers. Um, and it, it, the importance of it not being um, on a screen is is as significant, if not more. But also, I think it gets away from the point is that these children are in care and are in early learning because it's a proponent of the workforce and supporting families who are working. And families cannot work and maintain their jobs if they are having to try to maintain a child on a screen going to school, especially if that child is very young in like in that birth to five space. This is uh, Stephanie's comments, Gina's perfect and right on. The one thing I would add is we run a program that augments what family child, in-home family child care providers are able to do that includes screen time. Again, only for children uh, three and above and always with the child care provider as a way to enhance her ability to accomplish good things with that child. It's not a replacement for the teacher. In fact, it's it should never really be a replacement for the teacher, right? Um, you can't replace a teacher when you're talking about a six-month-old. Heck, a three-year-old, you can't replace a, a teacher. You know, we, we have safety issues. So I, I remember kids, uh, parents earning, children learning. This can help that, but it can't replace in the way that we might be looking to technology to solve some of our other issues. Yep. Thank you, Eric. Um, other questions from uh, for our panelists. It is 4:45 p.m., so we just have a few a few minutes left. Are there other questions? Uh, Christy, can I jump in with a just a quick con comment? This sure. is Karen Mosener, sure. and I just want to reinforce some of a lot of what's just been said and Eric's point about um, childcare as an economic driver, because as a, as an employer and as a provider of workforce services. I am deeply concerned about the stress on the child care system, um, pre-COVID and even more the impact of COVID. Um, and I agree that it is, it is a crisis. Um, we see so many of the job seekers that we're working with who can't get back into employment, can't even think about it right now because they've got kids at home and there's not child care available. And if we're losing more providers, that can, that's only going to, to worsen. Most of these are people who live in poverty. Most of them are women, most of them women of color. And, um, and these are people who could get off public benefits if they had, if they were able to get an employment, if they were able to get good child care. Um, and the thought that child care workers themselves need to be on public benefits because the wages are so low um, also points to that same economic argument. So, so I really see the need for advocacy and I'm also wondering, um, there's, there must be data out there that can kind of support that economic argument, both for um, both on the parent side and on the, the workforce side for child care workers. So it'd be great if we can, yeah. <laughs> if we can marshal that data as well. Eric, do you, you have an answer for the data question? Yeah, there is data. There's there's no industry I think has better data when it comes to the economic impact of its sector. 
you know, um, I, I've done work in other states in a previous job and, and in other communities. And one of the tools we often used was to fund a economic impact study. And, you know, you can do that. Oh my gosh, Brian Ross is on this call. You, you know this for all sorts of parts of our sectors in our community, right? It's a very common thing. And, you know, um, all sorts of sectors can have bragging rights. Childcare has this unusual experience. And that is that not only do you get the direct impact of the people who are employed in the sector. So statewide, we have about 75,000 registered teachers. Maybe about half of that are actually active right now. Um, uh, we have local data too, uh, uh, in terms of the number of teachers active right now. Um, but it's not just their economic impact and what their employers do. It's also then a portion of the salaries and the ac economic activity that the parents who come to childcare rely on. And so the economic impact of childcare is, is huge. It's actually the way I got into childcare. Um, the, the other thing I, I would say, uh, the Ohio economic impact study has not been done for a long time. It's, it's due to be redone, if, I, if you ask me. Um, but it, it, to do it, it, you have to have a, an audience for it. So it's part of a strategy. And being part of groundwork, um, which you know been with since the beginning, is, is the right place to, to park that. The other thing I would add in terms of like, what do we know about our workforce? We, we have lots of data. It's, it's not as tight and neat as the K-12 system data. And that's because our system is a non-system. So it's more heavily driven by survey. It's more heavily driven by point in time data as opposed to a continuous data stream. But in terms of what we know about the impact of loss of childcare on women's employment, that's solidly research. That's, that's actually where the, my PhD is in. Now that's solidly research. And the data that's come out recently because of the pandemic, no one's questioning that. Uh, around the country, that, that is a very hard figure. Uh, the, the last uh, BLS uh, data from uh, about women's employment overall, um, there's no question that it is related to child care. The question, though, is comes back to what should women be doing? What should African Americans be earning? What, what, what do we want in terms of the ideology of our, around family? Those are the things that we're, we're fighting against um, uh, to get people to understand that the early years matter. Child care is a real thing. It's early education not babysitting, and that these people who are building brains every day, literally while we're talking right now, there are childcare centers open where that's happening, they are undervalued. And um, so uh, better, we could do better on the data front, but it's not like we have to prove this. It's more about how we convince people that the data is important to act on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Madam, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, I would just also want to look at the, the long-term uh, economic impact of the, of the children who are served in these programs, especially low-income children. Um, and that's why this is important for the mayor. Um, you know, the data shows the, the importance of early learning programs on these children, uh, how uh, if they have, have the opportunity to attend a high quality early learning program, they're more willing, they're more uh, likely to graduate high school and college and have uh, stable relationships and own a home and own one or more cars and less likely to be incarcerated or have premature uh, birth and um, uh, be on welfare and things like that. So there are, there are a lot of different costs and there's a lot of data on this as well. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to add, um, this is Melissa Johnson from Starting Point and um, I fought really hard to get this presentation on this, for this resiliency and recovery, recovery group because I've been in childcare for over 25 years now, and it's been a, we've talked about this all the time, all the time, but I think this time we need action. We've got to make a case that we have to do something about it. Um, and I, and I, everybody did wonderful presenting. I was as quiet as I could be, so they did excellent explaining it, but we have to take action. We talked in data, we have all that. There has to be some steps to take action to fix this now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and she's right. She did fight hard to get this presentation, um, and th rightfully so. So thank you very much. We we appreciate you um, and what you bring to our committee. Um, and guess what? You'll be working on in phase two, uh, <laughs> along with many others. Along with many others. Um, I also want to just before we end to to our large employers on the on the phone or larger mid sized larger employers, you know. As you think about bringing your workforce back to work, you know, regardless of 
where your employees are, you know, in the pay scale and so forth, you know, childcare and the ability to have uh, quality, you know, early learning and kind of step back into, um, you know, the, the sector, uh, the come back to work it has to be on their mind. So what are you hearing from your employees as you start to think about people returning to work? Are you hearing about the need for child care or their ambivalence to come back because they may or may not have care? Yes, absolutely. Um, we find that, you know, a, a lot of our uh, team members are starting, you know, just married, getting married, maybe graduating from college and uh, then have, you know, a lot of them have had kids. And we had two folks who work for us and we, we do offer maternity and paternity. Um, it's not the best, but we try. Um, but there you have two staff members out, right? Just right away. And gosh, we don't wanna take that experience away from them. So, uh, you know, there's a replacement cost for that for the short term. And then when they come back to work, um, if schedules from other folks don't fit the schedules, they really need to balance the watching their kid or kids. Um, it's it's really awful to say, well, gosh, you know, here you have this family and you're going to get 20 hours a week instead of 40. So um, having solutions and and investing in these things and our company would be happy to we pay health insurance, we pay all kinds of things um, if we could do a public private partnership on something like this. I bet we could get some folks on board. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, well, there are other employers who may want to uh, share. I don't know if Natalie Bretz is still on here. I don't know if this is a, you know, a nationwide issue or not. Um, but, and I suspect that, um, oh, Natalie says yes, uh, working with their parents, as parent associate resource group, child care is the number one concern of their parents returning to work. Um, I suspect that we're going to hear more of that um, as time goes on, as, as return to work plans really uh, kind of heat up. And um, I know that we've already heard about it, even at YWCA Columbus, as we start thinking about people coming back to work, you know, child care, even though, you know, we have, we have it ourselves, but then we can provide it to employees and our employees are saying, hey, will there be a spot for us in one of our programs even, because they're not sure you know, how to come back to work right now with young ones um, at home. And that also for us, you know, we've also heard even about the uh, school age child care. So what, you know, what happens at the end of school day when you need that three to six care uh, as well uh, for elementary school, you know, students who can't, you know, go home and be alone and that kind of thing. So I think that this is something we're going to hear uh, more and, you know, Sandy, I don't know if you've heard about it, if this is something that's starting to, you know, get raised in your workplace or Sue Zazan, but I do think this is something, you know, as we get ready for phase two, maybe employers here can continue to, um, you know, even if you're, I don't know if you're querying your employees when they're ready to come back to work or if you hear about, you know, the child care concern before people come back to work, some data points that we might be able to collect. And Eric, as you, um, continue to, I know you're always collecting data. If you keep us apprised of your updates um, as we move through our second phase, um, because those updates will be important to us as we, as Melissa says, as we start do thinking about doing something um, about this and, and what the something should be, including, you know, stronger, stronger allies and advocacy, um, you know, because we're going to have to have stronger allies and advocacy at the state level. You cannot bypass them. And quite frankly, the one thing that gets their attention is is business. You know, is big business. I mean, Eric's shaking his head because we've been we've been at this table, uh, and it's frustrating. But um, but but it does get their attention. Uh, okay. Well, we're at four fifty six. I want to thank our panelists for being here with us today. Uh, thank you for this this rich conversation. Um, as we like to say to all of our panelists, we reserve the right to call you back um, in the second phase, and we probably will. Um, and uh, we thank you for uh, the, the content, for everything that you brought to, to this conversation. And as, as I said, um, we look forward to more discussion in, in phase two. We know that 
this intersects with so much of so many of the other topics that we are discussing. Um, and so this will probably, uh, you know, be a topic of, you know, in many, many of our uh, phase two conversations. So thank you very much. Thank everyone for being here with us today. Thank you for Melissa and Gina for keeping your uh, keeping us honest and making sure we had child care. A presentation specifically for child care to Shia Safford, same uh, with you and, and many others. Um, I think it was uh, it was a great conversation uh, that we need to have and we needed to have and, and look forward to the work ahead. And uh, everyone have a good evening. We'll see you next week. Brian Ross, you're up next week. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you. Take care.